If the government needs something made, it's supposed to look for a small business to make it. You've heard that. If no small business exists, an agency can get a waiver from the Small Business Administration to have it made by somebody else, another domestic company. But there's a problem with waivers. And for details, we turn to Blank Rome Procurement Attorney Justin Chiarotto. Justin, good to have you back. Good morning, Tom. Happy New Year. Great to be back. All right. So the government has been scrambling to find small businesses for a lot of the needs that it has. I mean, IT and services companies, dime a dozen, if you will. But the supplier base is shrinking for small business, even though more dollars are going there. So what is the basic requirement here? Let's set the scene. Absolutely, Tom. I think you're you're absolutely right to home in on the on the erosion of the small business base across industry in the last several years has been pretty well documented. Yes, the non manufacturer rule permits the small business set asides to provide products principle is of another small business unless those products are not available in sufficient quantities. And the exception here under the non manufacturer rule basically provides for the ability for a company to seek a waiver of the application of that rule to submit products in cases where there aren't compliant products available. That is to say a non-manufacturer can supply it. That's right. Essentially a a resale of products from a non-small business. So the non-small business could be a giant manufacturer, but they would use the small business as the way in, which is contrary to the standard way in which if you award to a small business, the small business must do at least 50% of the work. That is to say Northrop Grumman can't do 90% of the work under a small business set aside with the small business just being the conduit. That's right. And so, you know, typically you're looking for things like value added resale, right? Or there are small businesses that are providing additional value in this process in the supply chain to drive that base. But yeah, the issue is obviously creating a massive end around around the rule generally erodes the ability for manufacturers to develop the capacity to actually deliver these products. So the waiver process exists by which an agency goes to the SBA and says there's nobody to make these gyroscopes or these 16 by 27 foot steel beams. That's a small business. So we're going to have, you know, United Acme Steelworks make it, but it's going to be sold to us through mom and pop distribution company. Mom and pop distribution company. That's exactly right. So what's the problem? Well, there are a lot of problems. I think practically speaking, there's a lot of administrative process that needs to go into the waiver request generally. And- Frankly, there's not a lot of depth of manufacturing capability out here in a lot of these product categories, and more generally, a real strong demand, particularly looking at things like defense manufacturing and defense articles right now, you know, a tremendous demand on a lot of these products and not the ability for the manufacturing base to meet the demand. So you really have a confluence of issues. Complexity, limited resources, right, limited time within the contracting activities to move through this process, and a limited base. And how does that manifest itself and what, say, your clients ask you for help with? Yeah, it's a great question, Tom. I think it's important for companies to really be thinking about their outreach and go-to-market strategy as far ahead in advance of some of these opportunities as they can and really build awareness both within agencies and with other stakeholders within the procurement process, in my view, to get out in front and build the groundwork necessary for the, the procuring activities to be aware of this to be essentially helpful, right? You know, an extra potential pair of hands or tools to help ensure that these processes are being managed appropriately. You're seeing things like that with Inflation Reduction Act, right? Domestic manufacturing, those types of issues. You see a lot of people thinking about how to position themselves for these opportunities before they're on the table. We're speaking with procurement attorney Justin Chiarotto of Blank Rome. Maybe the real issue is that the small business manufacturers are out there. They just don't want to bid on government contracts because federal government contracts and a lot of state government contracts come with rules for your carbon footprint, rules for your labor practices, rules for your DEI, you name it. Maybe they're out there, but they say, who needs this when it comes to dealing with the federal government because of the enormous compliance costs? Well, and let's not forget the early holiday present of uh, a draft CMMC rule coming out as well for that cybersecurity. Too. So you're absolutely right. There is a tremendous burden that is added on top of this. And I think procurement community is, is working. Uh, you certainly see this with outreach to Silicon Valley on ways to make it easier for people to participate. There is the recent DOD rule for commercial item procurement that's seeking to streamline some of the burdens that contractors may face. I think there are also a lot of trade associations out there and efforts within the small business community to combine forces to build advocacy networks and outreach 
that can make it easier to do this. And, and I frankly think you'll need to see some industrial policy as well that is seeking to actually put money to work, right, for these things. You've certainly seen that with the submarine supply base. I'll call out as an example where a bunch of money has been basically pushed out through grant programs to try and stabilize that supply base. So I think there are a number of factors that are going to need to be brought to bear to arrest and turn around this erosion that we've seen and to, and to make it a more attractive marketplace. And what have you seen with respect to SBA and the process for granting waivers? How does the SBA verify that there actually is no one to bid on a particular contract? And who does the market research and how does all that work? Yeah, the market research, you have sort of a policing function, right? Because the contracting activity should be the one doing the market research to identify whether or not there are sufficient small businesses out, you know, in the community to meet a particular requirement. You know, SBA, from a resource perspective and and, and policing and reviewing that, again, it's this limited resource problem, right, of being able to come in and look at what potentially could be a smaller procurement, right? How can I bring in an extra set of eyes to do that? And so I think it really comes back to the importance of contractors that may see and again it shouldn't be a burden on the contractor to do it but to be thinking about how they can make their case build that network of advocates and many agencies are going to have a good office of small business utilization right procurement technical assistance centers are out there lawyers are out there uh lobbyists are out there certainly in this town that can again build this awareness and again create a set of usable data actionable data that's digestible that's easy to understand that can help make it easier to push this process along. And there are manufactured products, and then there are manufactured products. If you want to buy a production-level copier machine, well, there is no small business that makes such a thing. Or if you want to buy a fleet of electric vehicles, there are no, well, they started out big, most of them have disappeared, but there are no small businesses that can supply that. That's different. That's a different issue. You would have to go to a distributor or reseller, and that's probably the norm for copiers and electric vehicles or whatever. But what about small assemblies, machined parts, forgings, castings, connectors, extruded parts? These used to be made by thousands upon thousands of small companies. So you really have two classes of product here. Yeah, in that latter category, it's a huge challenge. I think we're seeing today the challenges that we have in these manufactured parts and their availability. There's been a lot of efforts to consolidate a lot of these suppliers within larger companies. It's a big problem. It's a big challenge. Because if the original OEM product was made by a large manufacturer, say that electric car and, you know, Tesla made it or somebody made it, well, they don't make most of the parts that go in there. And it's the parts that fail, not the chassis. And so if you need a new, I don't know, what's an electric car, a motor, you don't need oil, whatever you need in there, well, probably you can't get it from the OEM. That's right. That's right. Where can I get that steering knuckle, right, that I need to, you know, round the bend? And there are just fewer people and companies that are in a position to meet those needs. So I think it really, you know, it's this concept of a whole of government approach to address the erosion of the manufacturing base. When you look at the national security challenge and and the government is talking about this, you know, the the whole of government is talking about this specific pivot to strategic competition, there is an awareness and a recognition that we don't have the manufacturing capability in the United States and our allies, right, our our close friends, that we need to meet that challenge. This is an interesting manifestation of some of that problem and the resources that it's going to take. And it's certainly going to need dollars, right, put to work on this. But I also think trying to go it alone as a contractor is, is probably tough. It's finding those networks and trade associations and other advocacy channels that can help build this awareness where it's just not there right now. And perhaps maybe one course for the government is to gain visibility into the component supply chain at the outset of a procurement of, say, a platform. That's absolutely right. Um, And and certainly the government is going to want to know where its stuff is coming from. (laughs) Uh, That's become doubly important today. I mean, even manufactured products, right? We have a commitment in recent domestic preference law to increase the percentages of domestic content, right, in the coming years. And so I think there are a lot of forces that are coming to bear here that will eventually impact this. But today it's a challenge. And the government has to be prepared for what it costs to get replacement parts. If you ever tried to replace, say, the module in a 25-year-old double oven in the wall, which I have, well, you know, you can either get a whole new oven or you can get that module if you can find it. Yes, 
Well, and there, you know, you raise an interesting engineering uh, challenge. They don't make ovens like they used to, Tom, but 